from anywhere, but I'm sure you'll let us know if you're here from somewhere. All right, yeah. Um, just before I start, um, there's two Duncan Eastside residents here who'd like to speak, but they have not been put on the speakers list. And I know Jean Swanson is not here, so I wonder if, if uh, Aisha or Hendrik could take her spot. I think she is also. We don't here. have a provision for that, um, but Aisha did sign up in time. Um, Hendrik okay. did not. So. Um, okay, you're on it. Um, and I'd just like you to consider including Hendrik as well. I think he's been an invaluable part of the SEDSAC committee and a lot of committees here in the Dr. He was here, please, over there. Yeah, in the back. Um, so, um, CCAF, we did some research for the Community Economic Development Strategy uh, that we undertook over the summer. This is actually almost not kind of for me. Um, and uh, I think the idea is to release it at the town hall in January or so. Um, but what we did was we, we did town halls, we surveyed over 400 retail shops in the downtown east side and we talked to downtown east side residents about what kind of shops they would like to see in the neighborhood, about also what kind of barriers they, um, they face to accessing employment and uh, other positions. Um, and so far, what, some of the initial things we found was that non-profit places uh, big chain stores with low prices and Chinese grocery stores and restaurants were the most popular places for people to shop and to eat. Affordability, proximity, quality, non-judgment, and sense of community were some of the top factors people mentioned as important in choosing where to shop and to eat. New retail stores, cafes, restaurants, and the more gentrified parts of downtown East Side were listed as places where people do not shop or eat. And not just that, they don't feel welcome in these spaces and sometimes they're actively excluded least uh, out of these spaces as well. Price, language, prejudice, and security were listed as some of the top factors that made retail exclusive to low-income downtown east side residents. And so one of the key kind of questions we were asking through this research was um, what, what is retail that serves the low-income community? Uh, and our finding was maybe a bit contradictory was that actually there is no retail that serves low-income residents. Um, in the sense that, um, let's see here. A person on welfare has $18 at the most, actually less than that, to spend on food each week. So this means that even if a shop is relatively affordable and also welcoming to low income residents, and it's less of less of these shops in the Dalton East Side, as Phoenix said, a person on welfare can hardly afford it to buy anything at market rents, rates. Instead, people on welfare and disability and other forms of social assistance have to rely on non-market or free sources for food. That includes, you know, food lineups, the UGM, Evelyn Cellar, uh, and the party. Uh, while more affordable and inclusive retail does not truly meet the needs of low-income residents because they're so poor, uh, they do not either contribute to gentrification and the loss of low-income uh, housing in the neighborhood. <laughs> However, we're worried because as the neighborhood changes, it is likely that these businesses will also start increasingly catering to higher income residents. And that's also why we're worried about giving tax exemptions to businesses without any kind of conditions on that they'll continue serving the low income community. And so what we did when we surveyed, uh, surveyed the shops in the downtown east side was uh, we divided it to, into four different um, um, kind of categories of shops. We talked about zones of exclusions, and we mapped these. And so zones of exclusion are spaces where people are unable to enter because they lack the necessary economic means for participation. Zones of exclusion also become sites marked by increased surveillance and policing. Only those with status, privilege, and wealth can enter. All others are watched carefully, interrogated, and even criminalized for being in these spaces. And so what we found through the surveying, and I'm sure you all noticed this as well, is around developments like Woodward's, almost all the low-income shops or that cater to the low-income community have been replaced by high-end um, shops. You know, right there, the, we found shops that they sold people juice bottles for $10, you know. Um, there was a place you could get eyelashes for $200, but these are the kind of places that are coming into the Delta East side, and obviously low-income Delta East side residents don't afford to enter these spaces. Um, then there's other kind of retail, we call it gentrifying retail. 
And so gentrifying retail is retail that caters to and seeks to attract higher income residents or visitors. These retail spaces make the neighborhood more attractive to middle class people and incentivizes further investment and also gentrification, which is contributing to the loss of low income housing and businesses. And so actually what we're seeing is that, that a lot of, um, I see my time is up, shoot. Um, Actually, you know, even a lot of these social enterprises that are in the neighborhood and, and, and they hire some low-income residents, maybe as cleaners or whatever, they actually still contribute to gentrification <coughs> and they don't cater to low-income residents. Um, I have a few more things to say, but maybe someone else from CDAP can continue this presentation. Um, do you have questions from Councillor Alfred? So perhaps that will help uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, just a, a quick question. I guess it might be where you're going. What's your is there a solution that you have for us that you wanted to like? Is it is it putting in specific retail that's underwritten and that's dedicated to to lower income or? Yeah, I think uh, and maybe Aisha will develop on some of this as well. But the kind of recommendations that we came up with in CCAP and through our meetings was, you know, we really need measures to address the root causes of poverty and homelessness. It's like, I think Phoenix and others say, it is like, if you don't have housing, right? Or if you're not also criminalized for being on the street, which is part of the city's approach to homeless people, um, it's really hard to get employment or even to participate in these kind of programs, right? Um, but also, I think one of really important thing, in addition to supporting, uh, you know, retail in Chinatown and so on, we really need to stop these sorts of exclusion from coming into the neighborhood. So I think the city could implement measures to control what kind of businesses comes into the neighborhood and that downtown Eastside residents have a say over which businesses uh, get business licenses. And you don't think the downtown, the plan provides some security for that at all? Like that there is some measures in there for the kind of development that would be built will have, could include and should likely will include retail that might be. I mean, there is outside. this program with BC Housing, but that's only for buildings that are owned by BC Housing, right? But, you know, there's a lot of talk about all these vacant storefronts and you want to reduce the vacant storefronts by 50%. But we're worried, like, you know, what I'm hearing in the community is, like, people would rather have vacant storefronts than, like, a yuppie coffee shop, you know? Uh, and so uh, reducing the vacant storefronts just for the sake of reducing them really uh, it's not meaningful to downtown Eastside residents and actually has a negative impact on the community. And so, um, but I think another thing the city could do and should consider is also, you know, revising the downtown Eastside local area plan and looking at zoning measures. A lot of these businesses came into the neighborhood after the city opened up these areas for gentrification, including Chinatown, right? It pushed up the land values, it pushed out the small businesses, it made these neighborhoods with all the new condo developments going in, you have these coffee shops and restaurants where they sell coffee that starts at five dollars, but they're not catering to low income downtown Eastside residents. They're catering to the new condo dwellers that are moving into the neighborhood. So, thank you. Um, Ms. Wallstrom, you do have more questions from Councillor Di Genova. I just had a question based on your um, answer to Councillor Affleck, and that was regarding what you were talking about with vacant storefronts. I I'm not sure if this is even possible. I wasn't here uh, when the, the downtown local area plan was uh, passed. I uh, wasn't on council at the time. I'm wondering if, for instance, some type of measure where perhaps market would be the market rents in, in a sense, I'm not even sure we could do this, but some kind of structure where there was a discount for social enterprise, nonprofits, or locally based downtown east side businesses or stores, and then maybe a small percentage that was charged onto market rent uh, for, I'm, I'm not going to call them yucky coffee shops, but uh, perhaps, uh, let's say businesses that did not originate, that did not originate in the downtown spot. Or, uh, or don't uh, add to the local service or purpose. Just from what you were saying to Councillor Affleck, it, it sounded like you were looking for a solution. I'm just wondering yeah, if that's something you would suggest or do you have any recommendations specifically based on that? I'm not suggesting. That's one of the ideas coming out is to give tax exemptions to uh, community businesses or whatever. Um, like sure. a tax exemption, it's another way, but yeah. Right, but my, my worry about it is, right, it's like a lot of these, they're, they're private, they're businesses, right? They don't have a social mandate where they say, we're going to serve low-income downtown Eastside residents. And so how do we make sure that if they get a tax exemption, that they continue to serve the low-income community, right? Uh, and that's something that worries me. But also, how do we make sure that those tax exemptions go to 
you know, the actual businesses and not to the landowners of these spaces. Um, but one thing we talked about a CCAP, which I like, is would we have a tax surcharge for it. So they would actually pay higher taxes judged by businesses, and I think that would actually help the tier. That's you what so, I was so, so, that, right? That's, I, and I wasn't suggesting, I was just asking yeah. if that's what you were suggesting. I, I think that, that would be a good idea. But I think ultimately, and this is what came out through the survey as well, is we need more non-market, um, you know, I don't know if you'd call it retail, but places that serve food and social enterprise. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally, I don't really like social enterprises, but non-profit, non-market. I think um, <coughs> they're funded by the government, you know? Like the Carnegie, for example, which is not really I, I think I, I understand. I yeah. see a social enterprise, and, and I, I'd like to ask you what you see a social enterprise as. Do you see a social enterprise? I see it as uh, an organization that uh, reaches out to people who otherwise wouldn't have that opportunity and empowers them and pays a fair living wage. Yeah, I think there's a wide spectrum of social enterprises and the definition is kind of loose. Not all social enterprises are even uh, not for profit, right? You have some for profit social enterprises with a social mandate, but I think the problem with them is that they still they hinge on the market, right? Mm -hmm. And they're still trying to leverage the market to to make a profit, right? And so on the downtown east side, what that means is you have a lot of social enterprises that are catering to higher income residents, right? They're selling like fancy coffee or chocolate and things like that, um, which actually has a negative impact on the So community. you're okay, just to be clear, if they make a profit as long as it goes to social good or a social mandate? Um, no, I, I, I personally think there should be non-marketplaces that are subsidized by the government to provide for poor people. Like, um, people don't have enough money to buy food, and I think the government should step in, and they shouldn't have to rely on the market for people to survive. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, that's it for questions.